<laughs> our next speaker, I'm super excited. This is the time, guys. Like, it's, it's about to go down. This is um, why a lot of you guys are here. I know a ton of you guys have read this book. Um, Dan and I each want to share a little piece of the book that, that really struck a chord with us. Um, and then James is going to come up here and just drop some serious, serious knowledge on you guys. And the part of the book that really resonated with me was the analogy, the plane analogy in the book, where he talks about a plane taking off from LA, headed to New York, and how if it's just a few degrees off course, how that plane will not land in New York City. It'll literally land in Washington, D.C., hundreds of miles away. And how if you can just make a tiny little change to the trajectory of that plane, or for you guys, for the trajectory of your business, if just tiny little changes can have remarkable results. So if you guys are ready, let's, is my mic on? Hello, hello. If you guys are ready to hear from the guy that for me, I always remembered the line, you do not rise to the level of your goals, but rather you fall to the level of your systems. Let James Clear hear it and know if you're excited to have him in the house right now. America's number one best-selling author, James Clear. It's better if you stand at the end than the beginning. Um, <laughs> uh, hi. <laughs> um, I like talking about building good habits and breaking bad ones, kind of improving your performance, improving the trajectory that you're on, figuring out small changes, reasonable changes that you can make that can lead you to more success or to the desired result that you're trying to achieve. And to do that, I like to dive into different stories. So I wanna share a couple stories from Atomic Habits and from the work that I've been doing that maybe you all can take with you and kind of walk out of here and have a few things that you can remember and think about. I, my hope is that this presentation will be very practical, really actionable, and you can walk out of here and be like, you know what, I have a set of tools that I can use for building good habits and breaking bad ones. And my view is that there is no like one way to do this. You know, there's no one way to build a successful real estate business. There's no one way to build a better habit. There are a set of tools and my job is to lay the tools out on the table. And your job is to say, you know what? I think for my style or for my situation, I need a wrench or I need a hammer or I need a screwdriver. So let me go ahead and dive into some of those. You know, many of you, some of you may be familiar with the book already. And one of the stories I kicked the book off with is the story of the British cycling team. For many years, British Cycling is very mediocre. They have very modest performance on the world stage. You know, like, imagine the most mediocre person that you work with. If they're here, don't look at them. It's just, <laughs> he's right there. <laughs> it's like some nervous laughter. <laughs> Me? Um, for many years, British Cycling was that person. You know, and they wanted to change this. They wanted to perform at a higher level. And so they uh, hired this guy named Dave Brailsford, this performance director. And he came in and he had one concept, one idea, that made him a little bit different than the coaches that had come before. And he referred to that concept as the aggregation of marginal gains. The aggregation of marginal gains. And just like we were talking about a minute ago with the uh, plane shifting a few degrees, this idea of accumulating small improvements, of making slight changes to your trajectory, and how far that can take you in the long run, that was kind of at the core of his philosophy. And so the way that he phrased it was, listen, let's try to make all these little 1% improvements in nearly everything that we do related to cycling. So they, would, they started with a bunch of things that you would expect a cycling team to focus on. Like they put slightly lighter tires on the bike, they designed a more ergonomic seat, they asked each rider to wear a little chip, like a little feedback sensor, to see how the individual would respond to training and practice, and then they would adjust the workouts based on that data and feedback. But cycling is a competitive sport, and there are a lot of teams that are doing things like that. So then they started to make these little 1% improvements, these small adjustments related to cycling that nobody else was really thinking about too much. Or they weren't giving that much attention to. So for example, they hired a surgeon to come in and teach the riders how to wash their hands to reduce the risk of catching a cold or getting the flu. They have two different types of fabrics. They have indoor racing suits and outdoor racing suits and they tested those fabrics in a wind tunnel, and they found out that the indoor fabric was lighter and more aerodynamic, so they asked all of their riders to wear that suit when they raced. They um, have a large trailer, a big like semi-truck that carries a lot of the bikes in it to major events, and they stack the bikes up in there and they would paint the walls and the floor and the ceiling white 
so that they could better spot little bits of dirt and dust that might get in the gears and degrade the performance of the bikes. They even, uh, they even had each rider try like a dozen different types of pillows to see which one led to the best night's sleep for each person. And then once they figured that out, they would bring that pillow on the road with them to hotels for the Tour de France and other major races. So Brailsford said, you know, if we can actually do this, right, if we can make all these little 1% improvements related to cycling, then I think we can win a Tour de France in five years. Now, they had never won for over 110 years, and he ended up being wrong. They won in three years, uh, and then they repeated again the fourth year with a different rider, and then after a one-year break, they won the next three in a row. So after having never won for over 100 years, suddenly they win five out of the next six. But it was really at the Olympics in London in 2012 when this strategy kind of fully blossomed because you know the Tour de France, there's a team element to it, but ultimately one person wins the race. But at the Olympic Games, you have men's team, women's team, dozens of riders, dozens of events, and the British cycling team won 70% of the gold medals available in London. Rio, four years later, same story, 60% of the gold medals go to the British team. So this idea that 1% improvements are not just like nice to have, you know, they're not just a bonus or a cherry on top of your performance or some little extra, but that they actually can be a pathway to unlocking elite levels of success, exceptional levels of performance. I think, you know, it's a little surprising, a little counterintuitive, certainly underappreciated. So what I'm really getting at here, what we're really saying is that excellence is often not about radical change. It's about accruing small improvements over time. And you know, this is a fairly straightforward idea, right? Many of you have probably heard something kind of like this, get a little better each day, Kaizen, baby steps, like that kind of thing. But even though the concept of continuous improvement is fairly straightforward, most people don't take it seriously. And if you do take it seriously, if you do wake up each day and try to actually find some small margin of improvement, if you do show up each morning and actually try to find some way to get 1% better, some little advantage to carve out, man, you'd be surprised what that can turn into in the long run. You know, I like to visualize this in a couple different ways. So this graph, this chart's one way to visualize it, right? And what this is saying, what this is showing, is if you get 1% better each day for a year, so 1.01 .01 to the 365th power, you get 37 times better by the end of the year. If you get 1% worse, 0.99 to the 365th power, you drive yourself almost all the way down to zero. Now, this chart, this graph, this is just compound interest, right? It's just like a compounding curve. And real life is not exactly like compound interest. Your habits are not exactly like a mathematical formula. But man, I feel like charts like this do a good job of encapsulating what the process of behavior change feels like as you're showing up and trying to get a little bit better each day. You know, imagine you're at the beginning of this curve, right? You're at day one. So what is the difference between a choice that's 1% better or 1% worse? On any given day, not a whole lot. I mean, those lines are really close together in the beginning. You know, like what's the difference between eating a burger and fries for lunch or eating a salad? Today, like nothing, you know, your body looks the same in the mirror at the end of the night. The scale hasn't really changed. It's only two or five or 10 years later that you're like, oh, those choices do add up. Or like knowledge, same story. The person who spends 10 minutes each day reading a book or learning something new. Look, reading for 10 minutes a day does not make you a genius. But over 10 or 20 or 30 years, the person who always goes to bed a little bit smarter than they were when they woke up, the person who always finds time to learn something new, that can be a pretty meaningful difference in wisdom and insight. And so you see this again and again. What starts out small and is relatively insignificant, pretty easy to dismiss on any given day, it transforms, it multiplies, it compounds, becomes something much greater over time. And so for all of those reasons, I like to refer to habits as the compound interest of self-improvement. You know, the same way that money multiplies through compound interest, the effects of your habits multiply as you repeat them across time. Time will magnify whatever you feed it. So if you have good habits, time becomes your ally. And every day that goes by, you put yourself in a better position. But if you have bad habits, time becomes your enemy. And every day that goes by, you kind of dig the hole a little bit deeper. And so what I'm really getting across here, what I'm really trying to emphasize, this kind of first big idea of today, is an emphasis on trajectory rather than position. You know, there's so much discussion about position in life that we've saw all these metrics, all these measurements for analyzing our current position. 
what's the number on the scale, how much money's in the bank account, what's the current stock price, what are the quarterly earnings. We have all these ways of analyzing our current position. And then usually there's some kind of like guilt or judgment or analysis that comes out of that. Oh, I'm not where I wanted to be or we haven't achieved what we said we wanted to achieve. And what I'm encouraging is to say, listen, just for a minute, let's stop worrying so much about our current position and focus a little bit more on our current trajectory. Are we getting 1% better or 1% worse? Is the arrow pointed up and to the right or have we flatlined? Because if we're on a good trajectory, all we need is time. All you need is patience. But if you're on a bad trajectory, even if you're in like a pretty strong position right now, it's not gonna end well. Now, what all of us realize, what we all, what we all have felt, is that this is a double-edged sword. You know, habits can either build you up or they can cut you down. Like I like to say, we're all just kind of following our habits. You know, we're just doing our daily routine. And then one day, three years from now, knock, knock, who's there? Oh, the consequences of my past decisions. You know, it's like, <laughs> turns out that stuff creeps up on you. And we all know this, like we all have felt this just from going through life. And so what I'm trying to get laid out today, what I'm trying to teach and share with you is how to become the architect of your habits and not the victim of them. How to take control of the process and design it to your benefit rather than have it hinder you. All right, now I want to do this in a couple different ways. And if you buy into this initial part of the presentation, like, okay, look, I get it. Continuous improvement is important. Small changes can add up, blah, blah. Um, one question you could have is like, well, if this is so powerful, if this is so meaningful and it's relatively easy to do on any given day, why don't more people do it? And we have all kinds of like standard narratives and stories about this. You know, we talk so much about how hard it is to change your behavior and how difficult it is to build new habits and so on. And one of the common narratives is, well, maybe if you really wanted it, then you would do it. You know, maybe if you had more discipline or grit or willpower or persistence. And I don't want to totally dismiss that because certainly discipline and grit are very important qualities in life. But I don't know that that answer is quite right. You know, I think many people, certainly most people in this room right now, genuinely do want to improve, genuinely do want to perform at a high level, genuinely do want to fulfill their potential. So what I would say is, look, if you're struggling to improve, the problem isn't you. The problem is your system. We don't change, not because we don't want to change, but because we have the wrong system for change. And I think we could even go a step further and say, listen, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. You know, so often in life we're told you need to be more ambitious, you need to want it more, you need to think bigger, 10x your vision. But the truth is, like, setting the goal is kind of the easy part, you know? Like, I'm an author, right? So I can set a goal to sell 50 million books. It took me three seconds. Like, the goal is not the hard part, you know? It's building a system of behaviors that execute and carry you toward that outcome. And if I was going to put, like, a little finer point on the language, what do I mean by goal and system? Your goal is your desired outcome, the target, the thing you're shooting for. What is your system? It's the collection of daily habits that you follow. And if there is ever a gap between your goal and your system, if there's ever a gap between your desired outcome and your daily habits, your daily habits will always win. Almost by definition, your current habits are perfectly designed to deliver your current results. So whatever habits you've been following, whatever system you've been running for the last six months or year or two years, it's carried you almost inevitably to the outcomes that you have right now. Now, habits are not the only thing that matters in life, right? You've got luck and misfortune, randomness, but by definition, luck and randomness are not under your control, and your habits are. And the only reasonable, rational approach in life is to focus on the elements of the situation that are within your control. So let's talk about that now. Let's talk about how do we design and improve the gears of the system that you're running? How do we create a more efficient and effective machine? Now, I've been setting this up kind of like a dichotomy, right? We have goals and we have systems, but in fact, what you really want is both. You want an alignment between your desired outcome, your goal, and your daily habits, your system. Now, it's up to you to decide what your goals are. What are you optimizing for in business? What are you optimizing for as an individual? What kind of lifestyle do you want to have? But once you've decided that, it comes down to execution and building the habits that carry, can carry you there. And I can help with that part. All right, so let's talk about that. How do we change a habit? Now, 
I like to break a habit into four different stages. And I think if you understand these four stages, you not only understand what a habit is and how it works, but you also have four different places where you can intervene. They're kind of like different levers that you can pull for increasing the odds that you're gonna build a good habit and stick to it, or that you'll break a bad one. So let me give you the overview and then we'll break it down in detail, right? So real quick from a high level, the four stages are cue, craving, response, and reward. Cue, craving, response, and reward. So the cue is a trigger that tells your brain to initiate the habit, right? So just something that gets your attention. So you're driving down the road and you hear a siren come up from behind you, it's an ambulance. That's an auditory cue that starts the habit of pulling to the side of the road. Or um, your phone buzzes in your pocket, that's a physical cue, starts the habit of checking your phone. Or you walk into the kitchen, you see a plate of cookies on the counter, that's a visual cue that starts the habit of eating a cookie, right? Now the next thing that happens is your brain makes a prediction about what that cue means. So you walk into the kitchen, you see a plate of cookies on the counter, visual cue, and then your brain predicts more or less automatically without you really thinking about it, hey, this will be sweet, sugary, tasty, enjoyable. And it's actually that favorable meaning that you assign to a cookie that gives you this craving, this desire, this urge to, it motivates you to walk over, pick it up and take a bite. So that's the response, the actual habit that you perform. And then finally, oh, it is in fact sweet, sugary, tasty, enjoyable. There's something satisfying to it. Now, a quick note on this fourth stage, not every behavior in life is rewarding, right? Sometimes things have a cost or a consequence. Sometimes they're just kind of neutral and they don't really mean a whole lot. But if a behavior is not rewarding, if it doesn't benefit you in some way, if it's not pleasurable in some way or enjoyable, it's really hard for it to become a habit. Your brain needs some way to mark the experience and say, hey, that was enjoyable, that was worthwhile, you should do that again in the future when you're in a similar situation. So cue, craving, response, reward. All right, now this is kind of the scientific discussion of what's going on behind the scenes, and there's a lot more behind the science of all this and atomic habits, but I won't cover that here today. Um, what I like to do, what I think is most useful, particularly for folks like yourself, is how do we operationalize this? How do I turn this into something I can use, make it an, an actionable set of steps? So I've come up with what I call the four laws of behavior change. There's one for each step. So the first law is to make it obvious. You want the cues of your good habits to be obvious, available, visible, easy to see. Easier it is to see or get your attention, the more likely you are to act on it. The second law is to make it attractive. The more attractive or appealing a habit is, the more motivating or enticing it is, the more likely you are to feel compelled to do it. The third law is to make it easy. The easier, more convenient, frictionless, simple a habit is, the more likely it is to be performed. And then the fourth and final law is to make it satisfying. The more satisfying or enjoyable a habit is, the more rewarding or pleasurable it is, the more likely you are to feel compelled to do it in the future. So make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. Now, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, you know, I have this habit, like I've been trying to stick to it or trying to get going, but I just keep procrastinating. Or maybe you're thinking about, you know, we have this thing we keep asking our teams to do or we keep asking our clients to do some behavior and they only do it every now and then, they're being inconsistent with it. You can just go through these four steps and ask yourself, how can we make the behavior more obvious? How can we make it more attractive? How can I make it easier? How can I make it more satisfying? And the answers to those four questions will reveal different things that you can do to increase the odds that you're gonna to stick to the habit for the long run, right? So make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. These four steps, this is like the high level picture, the 10,000 foot view of how to build a good habit. If you want to break a bad habit, then you just invert these four. So rather than making it obvious, make it invisible. Unsubscribe from emails, don't keep junk food in the house. If you're trying to follow a new diet, don't follow food bloggers on Instagram. You know, like reduce exposure to the queue. Rather than making it attractive, make it unattractive. Rather than making it easy, make it difficult. Increase friction, add steps between you and the behavior. Rather than making it satisfying, make it unsatisfying. Layer on some kind of cost or a consequence, especially if it's an immediate cost. So, Make it obvious, attractive, easy, satisfying for building a good habit. Make it invisible, unattractive, difficult, unsatisfying for breaking a bad one. Now what I wanna do is give you a couple examples of how to do these things. There are many ways to do each of these. 
So there are many ways to make habits obvious, many ways to make them easy, and so on. And there are many ways to make them invisible and unattractive, and so on. Um, Atomic Habits is kind of the reference guide there, like most of uh, all of those different strategies are in there. Just for the sake of time, I'm gonna give you a couple examples uh, of these different ones so that you can walk out of here and have an idea of what this might look like. All right, let's talk about the first law, make it obvious. So, quick story here. Massachusetts General Hospital, large teaching hospital in Boston. There's a researcher there named Ann Thorndike, and she and her colleagues had this interesting question, which is, can we get people to change their behavior without motivating them, without increasing their willpower. In fact, we're not gonna to talk to them at all. So what the researchers did was they went into the hospital cafeteria. So here's a picture, drawn to scale. We've got these um, gold-shaded boxes here. Okay, those are different refrigerators that have Coke, soda, juice, different drink options in them. Then you have the two dark boxes, the small ones on the sides of the room. Those are little refrigerators that have water. And then all the other shapes are different food stations, food buffet lines, and so on. Now, what the researchers did was they went into the cafeteria and they added water to the main refrigerators. So there's still Coke and soda and juice, all right, but they added water. And then they also added some of these little rolling carts around the different food stations and food buffet lines, and those had water in them as well, right? So they increased the prevalence of water in the environment. What happens, six months later, 25% more water is sold, 11% less soda, and whenever I come across studies like this, I call these like environment design studies because they're kind of reshaping or redesigning how the environment's laid out. And I always think it's interesting, you know, imagine you went up to somebody in that cafeteria and you were like, hey, why'd you get a water? You're like, what are you talking about? You know, like, this is what I wanted to drink. Like, why'd you buy a Coke? This is what I felt like having. But the truth is, some percentage of them chose that option just because of how it was presented to them. And this is one of the most overlooked drivers of your habits and behavior, which is the shape of your physical environment. The things that are on your desk in your office, the way your kitchen is laid out, the items in your living room, like all of these spaces where we live and work each day, they influence the choices that we make. And sure, if you are well rested, if you have extra time, if you're good on energy, maybe you make whatever choice you want. But if you're tired, if you're pressed for time, if you're stressed and exhausted, what are you gonna choose? You're gonna choose the path of least resistance. And so by reshaping the rooms where you spend time each day, you can improve the odds that you'll stick to the habits you wanna build. I think one interesting question you can ask yourself is just think of one habit you're trying to create and then walk into the rooms where you spend most of your time each day and ask yourself, what behaviors are obvious here? What behaviors are easy here? What is this space designed to encourage? And you'll start to notice different things that you can do to increase the odds that you can stack the deck in your favor and be more likely to do the thing you want to do. If you want an example of this, you know, a lot of people feel like they watch too much TV, but walk into any living room. Where do all the couches and chairs face? You know, it's like, what is this room designed to get you to do? And I'm not saying you need to rearrange your entire house, but you get the point, right? Like, if you want a habit to be a big part of your life, make the queue a big part of your environment. We all have these things that we say are important to us, but then you look around the spaces where we live and work and they're not the obvious choice. Okay, so make it obvious. All right, second law now, make it attractive. Let's say you go to bed tonight and you're like, ah, listen to this guy talk about habits today. So tomorrow's gonna be the day. <laughs> I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go for a run. <laughs> so you set your alarm, it's like, I don't know, 6.15 or something, 6 a.m. So six, six rolls around and uh, your bed is warm. It's cold outside, you're like, ah, press snooze, I can do it tomorrow. But if you come back to today and you send a text to your friend, and you say, hey, can we meet at the park at 6.15 and go for a run? Well, now 6 a.m. rolls around and your bed is still warm and it's still cold outside but if you don't get up and go for a run, you're a jerk because you leave your friend at the park all alone. Now, you haven't really made the run itself any easier, right? The run's gonna suck just as much as it would before. But you have kind of changed how attractive that option seems to you. You've simultaneously made it more attractive to get up and go for a run and less attractive to press snooze and sleep in by texting your friend. Now, these are, this is a strategy called a commitment device. There are a bunch of examples of them in Atomic Habits. Um, and Commitment devices can change how attractive a particular habit seems to you. 
and they can be useful for short-term motivation. I think they can be great for getting you going today or this week. If you want to stick to a habit for a long time, if you want it to remain attractive for years or in some cases even decades, I think there's a second element that you can capture and utilize, and that's the power of the social environment. You know, we are all part of multiple tribes. Some of those tribes are large, uh, like what it means to be American or what it means to be Australian. Some of those tribes are small, like what it means to be a neighbor on your street or a member of the local CrossFit gym or a volunteer at the elementary school. But all of those groups that you belong, belong to, large and small, they have a set of shared expectations, a set of norms for how you act and what you do when you're in that group and part of that tribe. And when habits go with the grain of the groups that you're in, they're pretty attractive because they signal to the people around you, hey, I get it, I fit in, I belong, I'm part of this. And when they go against the grain of the tribes that you belong to, they're kind of unattractive because you like are going against, you're rubbing against the expectations of the group. You know, like, I could be wearing a bathing suit right now, but that would be weird, right? <laughs> We'd like violate every expectation we have about what you do when you give a presentation like this and how you behave at a conference. And so in a sense, I chose what I wore today but only a little bit, you know? Like it was mostly shaped by the group and the tribe that I was gonna be a part of by this room that we're all in right now. And so I think the punchline, the practical takeaway, is you want to join groups, you want to join tribes where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. Because if you're in groups where your desired habits are normal, it's gonna be very attractive for you to do that. You know, like if I walk outside my house and I look across the street, I might see my neighbor mowing their grass or cutting their lawn. Well, maybe not in March, but I don't know, a month or two from now. And uh, you know, I might think, hey, you know, like I need to mow the grass too. And you'll stick to that habit for five or 10 or 20 years, like however long you live in that house. And why do you do it? Partially you do it because it feels good to have a clean lawn, but mostly it feels good to have a clean lawn because it'll be judged by the other people in the neighborhood for being the sloppy one. You know, and so it's actually the expectation of that group, the neighbors, that motivates that habit. And so the more that you can get an alignment between the groups that you belong to and the habits that you want to build, the more that you can rise together. And you see this kind of thing all the time. People start soaking up habits they weren't even intending once they get firmly entrenched in a group. You know, like somebody goes to a CrossFit gym thinking they're going to get in shape, and then six months later, they're all eating paleo and wearing the same brand of knee sleeves and buying the same workout clothes. Like, they weren't even intending to do any of that stuff. They just soaked it up once they became part of the group. So, which people already have the habits that you want to have, and how can you start spending time around them and floating around in those groups and building relationships? I think that's the key question. We've talked about physical environment, talked about social environment. You know, punchline I think is the same. I've never seen someone consistently stick to positive habits in a negative environment. Maybe you can do it for a day or a week or I don't know, a month or two, but like at some point, it's almost like a form of gravity. You know, it's just constantly tugging you back to what the norm is in that group or in that space. Every room that you're in has a default set of behaviors that are easy and obvious there that you're kind of being ushered toward. Every group that you're a part of or tribe that you belong to has a set of expectations and social norms that are, you're kind of be, being tugged toward. And as best as possible, you want to use those forces to benefit you rather than to feel like you're running into a headwind all the time. All right, make it obvious, make it attractive. Third law now, make it easy. This is a picture of Twyla Tharp, famous dance choreographer and instructor. She won a MacArthur Genius Grant. She's basically spent her whole career kind of touring Broadway and doing different original work. And uh, she's also a big fan of habits. So she has a quote, I want to read it to you, and then we'll unpack it a little bit, right? So here's what she says. I begin each day of my life with a ritual. I wake up at 5.30 a.m., put on my workout clothes, my leg warmers, my sweatshirts, and my hat. I walk outside my Manhattan home, hail a taxi, and tell the driver to take me to the Pumping Iron Gym at 91st Street and 1st Avenue, where I work out for two hours. The ritual is not the stretching and weight training I put my body through each morning at the gym. The ritual is the cab. The moment I tell the driver where to go, I have completed the ritual. It's a simple act, but doing it the same way each morning habitualizes it, makes it repeatable, easy to do. It reduces the chance that I would skip it or do it differently. It is one more item in my arsenal of routines and one less thing to think about. 
All right, now let's step back for a second. You know, if, I, if you were to go to like an academic or a researcher and ask them to define like what a habit is, they're gonna say it's really quick, mindless, automatic stuff. You know, they're gonna be talking about things like brushing your teeth or tying your shoes or every time you pick up a pair of barbecue tongs, you tap them together twice, you know, like just <laughs> stuff that you don't even think about. <laughs> it's like obviously I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if I were to ask you, hey, what are some habits that you're trying to build? You know, you're not gonna pick stuff like that. You're probably gonna say something like, oh, I wanna get in the habit of writing every day, or I wanna get in the habit of going to the gym four days a week. And I know what you mean when you say that. You know, you mean I wanna make it this regular thing that I do consistently, I wanna make it a ritual. But like writing, for example, pretty effortful, you gotta think like fairly carefully about it. Is this the right word or not? Should I cut that sentence? It's not gonna be mindless the way that brushing your teeth might be. Um, Real estate, you know, I don't know what each of your roles are, but prospecting, calling different uh, clients, looking for new properties, like, this is a huge part of the habits that you need to build. And um, I think Twilo Tharp can provide a key answer that really is crucial for tasks like that uh, or for other habits that you're trying to build. So if you were to think about the high leverage stuff in your uh, role, if you did a classic 80-20 analysis, we're gonna list out everything that you do each day and you gotta cut the bottom 80% of it. But if you really knock it out of the park on the 20% that remains, if you just totally crush it, you probably still have a job because those are the things that really move the needle. If I had to guess, the things that are in that bucket, that's the stuff that you probably want to do more habitually, that you probably want to make a regular practice and a ritual because that's the things, those are the things that really move the needle. Um, but they also are usually things that require careful effort and concentration. So how do we bridge that gap? How do we do this mindless and automatic habit for the thing that you need to concentrate on? And I think Twyla Tharp provides the, uh, the answer, which is you focus on the cab, not the gym. You focus on the entry point to the high leverage work and you make that as automatic and as habitual as possible. And then you use that momentum to carry you into the tasks that really move the needle for you. So let me give you a couple examples. Um, each morning there's this moment that kind of shapes how my day is gonna go, right? So for me, the high leverage behavior, the highest leverage thing is almost always writing the next piece of content, writing a chapter of a book or a newsletter for that week or whatever. So I wake up, say I go to my office, it's like 9 a.m. or something, and one of two things happens. Either I sit down on my computer and I open up Google Docs and I start writing the next thing I'm gonna work on, or I go to ESPN and I check the latest sports news. And what happens in the first hour is pretty much shaped by what happens in the first 45 seconds. Because if I go to ESPN, that hour's pretty much shot. But if I start writing, even if it's just for a minute or two, then it's like, oh, okay, now I'm into the work and the momentum kind of carries you forward. And so the real thing that I need to master is not writing for an hour. The real thing I need to master is that entry point, the cab and not the gym, the opening up of the dock that is the high leverage work. Similar example, so before uh, the pandemic, my wife and I would work out at the same gym together, and um, we're still together, we just don't work out at the gym. But <laughs> I realized that was phrased strangely. Um, so anyway, she would get home from work, same kind of thing, 6 p.m., and one of two things happens. Either we change into our workout clothes, and we go to the gym, and we do the workout, or we sit on the couch and watch The Office and order Indian food. And both of those are good nights, but they're very different nights. And the whole thing that shapes it is do we change into our workout clothes or not? If we change clothes, the next two hours are already done. You know, like we'll get in the car, we'll do, go to the gym, we'll do the workout, like it's already over at that point. So I think the question to ask yourself is twofold. One, what are those high leverage tasks for me? What are the habits that really move the needle? When I'm living a good day or when I'm really effective, what are the things that are in that category? And then two, what is the cab and not the gym? for that? What's the equivalent of changing into your workout clothes? And can you just master that little movement and get the momentum going? Can you make that action as automatic and as habitual as possible? All right, one way to do this is what I call the two minute rule. And of course, I hope you find the whole presentation interesting and useful, but if you can only remember one thing, the two minute rule is a good pick. And I say that because it can be applied to pretty much any habit that you're trying to build. All right, so it's very simple. It just says, take whatever habit you're trying to create and you scale it down to something that takes two minutes or less to do. So read 30 books a year becomes read one page. 
or do yoga four days a week becomes take out my yoga mat. Now, sometimes when I mention this, people are like, okay, buddy. You know, I know the real goal isn't just to take my yoga mat out. I know I'm actually trying to do the workout. So this is some kind of mental trick, and I know it's a trick. Why would I fall for it, basically? And I get it. You know, I, I, I understand where people are coming from. But I have this reader. His name's Mitch. I mentioned him in Atomic Habits. He lost over 100 pounds. He's kept it off for more than a decade now. And when he first started going to the gym, he had this strange little rule for himself where he wasn't allowed to stay for longer than five minutes. So he'd get in the car, drive to the gym, get out, do half an exercise, get back in the car, drive home. And it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds silly. Clearly, this is not going to get the guy the results that he wants. But if you take a step back, what you realize is that he was mastering the art of showing up. You know, he was becoming the type of person that went to the gym four days a week, even if it was only for five minutes. And this is a much deeper truth about habits, something that people often overlook, which is a habit must be established before it can be improved. You know, it has to become the standard in your life before you can scale it up and turn it into something more. And I don't know why we do this, but we tend to get very all or nothing about our habits. You know, we're so focused on optimizing. We're so focused on perfecting, finding the perfect sales strategy or the best business plan or the ideal workout program. We're so focused on optimizing that we don't give ourselves permission to show up, even if it's just in a small way. But... I'm reminded of that quote from Ed Lattimore where he says the heaviest weight at the gym is the front door. I, there are a lot of things in life that are like that. You know? And if you can master the art of showing up, if you can gain a little foothold, even if it's less than what you ultimately hope to do, then you're, you're in the game. Now you're in the arena and you have a chance to actually improve something. If you're stuck on the sidelines just theorizing about what would be the perfect way to do it, all you end up with is a decent idea and a good plan on paper, but no results to optimize. All right, so the two-minute rule can kind of push back against that perfectionist tendency and give you a chance to improve something, to optimize something, and master the art of showing up. All right, so fourth and final law here, make it satisfying. This is a picture of a habit tracker. In addition to Atomic Habits, I have a habit journal. This is the little tracker at the back. You've probably seen things like this before. You can have a template like this where you put an X down for each day that you do your habit. You can use a calendar and do it. The idea is pretty similar, which is, you're focused on building up a streak of X's. And putting down an X on a piece of paper is not a big thing. I'm not gonna act like it's some huge, huge deal. But it does something important, which is it visualizes your progress. And one of the challenges of building better habits is that a lot of the time you show up and you do the right thing and then you have nothing to show for it really. It takes time for rewards to accumulate. It takes time for results to build. So like my parents, for example, they like to swim. So they go to the Y and they get in the water and they do their workout and they swim and then they get out and their body looks exactly the same as it did when they jumped in. You know, like they have no evidence that that day's workout was worth it. But they take a little tracker like this and they put an X down and they add up all the X's from that month and compare it to the month before and it's just a little signal that gets them to show up again the next day. And whether you do something like this or not, I don't think it matters too much. I think the question to ask yourself is, how can I visualize my progress while I'm waiting for those long-term rewards to show up? Can I have some signal that, hey, I'm on the right path, and all you need is a little bit of patience? So a habit tracker is one way to do that. Now, as you start building up that streak of Xs, you're going to start getting a little bit of a, a streak going, and five, six, seven, eight days in a row. And I think at that point, your only mantra, your little philosophy or mindset should be don't break the chain. It doesn't matter how good or how bad that particular day was. It doesn't matter how you feel about it or whether it got the exact result you wanted. Just don't break the chain. And you can trust in that process and that momentum building up. Now, don't break the chain is a good idea. Uh, and I think it is very motivating for people when they're in the middle of a streak. But at some point, you got to travel for work or your kids get sick or you need to do something for your parents or whatever. Some emergency of life weasels its way in and breaks the streak. And every streak breaks at some point. And it's kind of easy to feel like you lost your progress then, you know, to feel like, oh, I had everything going really well, but now I fell off. And so I like to combine this philosophy, this mindset of don't break the chain with a second mantra, which is never miss twice. So, you know, maybe you're sticking to a new diet and you do it for eight or nine days and then the 10th day you binge eat a pizza. Well, you know, I wish that hadn't happened, but never miss twice. So let's make sure the next meal is a healthy one. Or in my case, the, um, the habit that kind of launched my career 
was I wrote a new article every Monday and Thursday. And I did that for three years. Well, you know, if I missed on Monday, I wish that hadn't happened, but never missed twice. Let's make sure I pour all my energy into getting one out on Thursday. And what you start to notice if you look at top performers in a lot of different industries is that these people are human. You know, they all make mistakes like everybody else. But they tend to be very good about getting back on track quickly. And I think we all kind of know this at some level, some implicit level, that it's rarely the first mistake that ruins you. It's like the spiral of repeated mistakes that follows. It's letting slipping up become a new habit. That's the real problem. And so if you can cut that off at the source and never miss twice and get back on track quickly, if you can course correct, if the reclaiming of your habits is fast, the breaking of them doesn't matter that much. So never miss twice is one thing to keep in mind. Um, all right, quick recap. Cue, craving, response, reward. Make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, make it satisfying. Now, we're gonna take uh, some questions here in a few minutes, but before I do that, I want to let you in on what I consider to be the secret of this talk. And the secret is, it's not actually about little habits, it's actually about believing something new about yourself and changing the story that you have about who you are and what you stand for. And this is a concept that I refer to in the book as identity-based habits. And the key idea is that true behavior change is really identity change. It's really shifting who you are and what you stand for. It's changing the narrative that you have in your head about what's normal for you. And this is why I say things like, look, you know, the real goal is not to run a marathon. The goal is to become a runner. And the goal is not to read a book. The goal is to become a reader. The goal is not to do some silent meditation retreats to become a meditator. And in these examples, I'm using actual labels, reader, runner, meditator, but it's true for characteristics as well. You know, like I'm the type of person who finishes what they start, or I'm the type of person who shows up on time. And once you start to believe in that narrative about yourself, once you start to assign that kind of aspect or element of your identity, it becomes easier to follow through on the behavior. You know, somebody who views themselves as I'm a runner, they don't have to motivate themselves to go for a run in the same way that somebody who's just getting started does. You know, it's kind of like, no, like, this is just part of what my normal day is. This is just part of what I do. And once you start to assign a habit to an aspect of your identity, once you start to believe in it at that level, you'll fight tooth and nail for it if you take pride in it. You know, like if you take pride in the size of your biceps, you never miss arm day at the gym. Or if you take pride in how your hair looks, you have this long hair care routine. You do it every day. And so the aspects of our story that we have pride in, that we feel good about, that we assign to our identity, they work hand in hand with the habit itself. It becomes easier for the two of them to coexist. So I think this is the real reason, the true reason that habits matter. We often talk about habits as mattering because of the external results they'll get us. Hey, habits can help you be more productive or reduce stress or make more money. And that's true, like habits can help you do that stuff and that's great. But the real reason, the true reason that habits matter is that every action you take is like a vote for the type of person you wish to become. And so no, doing one push up does not transform your body, but it does cast a vote for, I'm the type of person who doesn't miss workouts. And no, making one sales call does not make you the world's best real estate agent, but it does cast a vote for, I'm the type of person who makes calls every day. And no, Writing one sentence does not finish the novel, but it does cast a vote for, I'm a writer. And individually, these are small things, but collectively you start to build up this body of evidence. And each instance of the habit, even if it's small, casts a little vote onto the pile. And once you start to have this mountain of votes, you start to shift the scales in favor of that story. And this is a little bit different than what you often hear. You know, you often hear people say something like, um, fake it till you make it. Now, look, I don't necessarily have anything wrong with fake it till you make it. It's asking you to do something, uh, to believe something positive about yourself. But it's asking you to believe something positive without having evidence for it. And we have a word for beliefs that don't have evidence. We call it delusion. Right? Like at some point, your brain doesn't like this mismatch between what you are and what, you're say, what you say you are and what you're actually doing. So behavior and beliefs are a two-way street. The actions that you take, the habits that you build influence what you think about yourself, and the mindset that you have and the beliefs that you have influence the actions that you take. But my argument, my encouragement, is to let the behavior lead the way. To start with one small action, with one sales call, or one minute of meditation, or one sentence, or whatever it is, 
and to let that be evidence that in that moment, you were that kind of person. And gradually, as the evidence builds up, you have every reason in the world to believe it. All right, I'm not gonna bore you with the stats on the book. Um, it's done incredibly well, I'm very fortunate. All I wanna mention is that it's there for you as a reference guide. So uh, if you're wondering, hey, what other things can I do to make habits easier? How else can I make them obvious? The, the book covers all that in much greater detail. Um, let's take a little bit of time for questions. And uh, I think we have a mic runner coming around the room. I see a hand here. If you have questions, just uh, gradually put your hand up and we'll make our way around to you. Why don't we start over here with this one? Back on. There we go. Thank you. That was great. Appreciate it. So I had a question. When you're saying um, you want to be somebody, it's easier to follow your habits. So let's say I want to be healthy, and I'm being a healthy person, but I love chocolate. What do you do with that? I like chocolate, too. I think that's part of being healthy. Um, I, uh, yeah. Um, there are many things that are part of your identity, right? Like you are, you know, in my case, I'm a dad, a brother, a son, I'm tall, I'm, you know, from America, I also like working out. Like you can just go down the list, right? You're many different things and all that is true for all of us. And uh, so you're not asking yourself to not be something 100% of the time. I think it's more about when do I want to emphasize these things? And I want to emphasize being healthy to the degree that it gets me working out four or five days a week. And so those hours are very important. I don't want to emphasize it so much that I never eat chocolate. Um, and so I think it's just about figuring that out for yourself. What is the proper blend of traits that feels good to you? Um, occasionally, your values or your identity will come into conflict and you'll have to make a choice. I think whether I have a piece of chocolate cake at a restaurant is a fairly small choice and I'm not worried too much about it. Um, but it's an example uh, that you brought up. And to a large degree, you actually don't really know your values until you have to choose between them. Um, you know, everybody says they value family, but when they have an important work trip, do they choose to stay home or do they choose to go on the trip? Um, and so you don't really know what you're valuing until you have to make that decision. Um, that said, I don't know that it's fair to put that kind of pressure on yourself to always be perfect or to have such a clear division because when you go on the work trip, you are also providing for your family, and so that is serving that value in an indirect way. And I think the problem is not that you should never go to work so that you can always spend your time with family, or vice versa. The problem is figuring out what that balance needs to be for you and what feels like that is properly feeding the identity that I wanna build. Um, and that's a uh, very much a kind of like, it depends answer to your question, but the truth is it does depend. And I think the only way to figure out that answer for yourself is to spend time reflecting on it and thinking about it. The last thing I'll add as part of this question, because I do think it's an important one, is the answer will probably change over time. And so I find that I'm a very different person now than I was 10 years ago. And the things that I want to emphasize, the type of identity that I want to have, the habits that I need to support and feed that identity are all different than they were before. So this idea that you'll somehow find yourself and then through this exercise, you now won't have to worry about it anymore. That's not really how it works. I did this interesting thing last summer where every day for two weeks, I started my day, I would open up a notebook and I'd write at the top of the page, what do I actually want? And then I'd spend a couple minutes kind of writing down my answer. And what's funny is you would think it's kind of useless to ask yourself the same question 14 days in a row, but actually my answer evolved a lot. And things that I was initially writing down, it turns out, actually, I don't really want that. That's something that my parents want, or that's something that my friends want, or my peers want. Or actually, I don't need this. This is just a middle step. I can cut it out entirely. And so I think the only way to come to a good answer to a question like that is uh, to have a process of reflection and review. And that can be whatever you decide it to be. I tend to do a weekly review on Fridays. That one's more business related. Um, and then I also do an annual review at the end of each year where I kind of ask myself, what are my core values and how are my habits feeding or not feeding those values? Um, but the answer is the same, which is you need to actually have time to think. If you're so busy living daily life that you don't give yourself time to reflect on those things, then it's hard to figure out what those priorities are. Um, and the priorities are gonna shift over time, so you need a process for continually revisiting it and uh, reflecting and coming back to it. 
It's a good question, though. Let's go back here. Yeah. Uh, I can hear you. Go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Awesome. Um, so for you personally, what are some of the habits that have most led to personal mastery and fulfillment? And so like sp as specific as you could be, like what are some of those daily things that you do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, before you ask the question of like what leads to personal mastery, you have to be clear about what you're trying to master. So I think the first question to ask yourself is what am I trying to optimize for? And that question's different, you know, di that can be different for one person throughout time, but it also tends to be very different across people. You know, people, sometimes you're optimizing for money, sometimes you optimize for free time, sometimes you optimize for creativity, like there's all kinds of things. So that's the first question I always ask myself, what am I trying to optimize for? Once I figure that out, then the next question I ask is, how do I want to spend my days? You know, um, if you are already, there, there's some baseline here that needs to be met, which uh, for just in terms of like making money to s provide for your daily life, okay? And once you are at that baseline, to choose to make more money, but to live a worse daily life is a terrible trade in my view. But we do it all the time. People make that choice constantly. They choose to make more money, but somehow have worse hours throughout the day. Um, and. I try to put a positive constraint around myself and say, how do I want to live my days? And then within that box, how can I reach the most people or make the most money or make the biggest impact, but not outside of it? And when you start with that lens, you end up making very different decisions. Um, and it requires you to check out from the typical status chasing that often happens in every industry. Because if you want the signals of common, like the common markers of status, then you often end up having terrible days. There's that one line, I think Paul Graham said something like, uh, if you want people to work in an awful job, give it a really fancy title and high pay. And <laughs> like, that's usually just a way of masking the fact that it's a terrible way to spend your time. Um, so what are you optimizing for? How do you want to spend your days? So I think you start there. Having said that, the answer to your question, what habits do I find really useful? Um, they're probably not gonna be that big of a surprise, but the things that make the biggest impact on my daily life are, do I work out? I try to work out four or five days a week. I don't think I'd be an entrepreneur if I didn't work out. Um, Richard Branson has said something along those lines too. Like the, for me, the emotional roller coaster of the early years, particularly of entrepreneurship, the first like five years, it's just, it's a lot and there are a lot of days where you feel like nothing good happened today. I didn't make any progress, but at least I had a good workout. That, that saved a lot of days for me. Um, so working out, um, I am a writer, but actually what I need is to be a reader. So reading is a huge part for me. For a little while I thought, hey, if I really wanna be a good writer, I should spend more time writing. But actually the writing got worse. And now I liken it to driving a car. So the point of having a car is not to sit at the gas station all day and fill the tank up with gas and never go anywhere but you also just can't drive forever because then you end up with no gas on the side of the highway. And for me, reading is like filling up the tank and writing is like going on an adventure and I need both. So um, reading is a huge uh, habit. Working out, reading. Um, I mentioned reflection review a minute ago. That's another big one. I, I think that this is a strength of mine. I think I'm fairly good at the strategy side of the business. So I have to watch like thinking too much and not executing enough but I do think it matters. Like you can put yourself on a very different trajectory if you're doing the business in a more strategic manner. So I'll say those three. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll just call that working out, reading, and uh, thinking time. Yeah, let's go right here. Hey guys, I'm Maggie. I'm from Jacksonville. Thanks so much, James. Um, I loved your podcast with Tim Ferriss. Oh, you thank you. You guys have a similar voice, intonation, and um, I, I didn't know that, but you're like the 15th person that's told me that now, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. I uh, am Tim Ferriss. Um, <laughs> okay. yeah. um, my question for you, a lot of us here at EXP and not at EXP, it's about attracting talent. And you know, I find that on that podcast, you basically gave away your formula for success from you know, having the newsletter to planning the, the TV spot to whatnot. Yeah. And I want to, I wonder like, what made you focus on atomic habits? Because everything else sort of fell into play when you had those, those habits for yourself 
and you're sharing you know, your formula for success, but I'm curious, what made you choose this topic as what you were gonna break out into the world with? Yeah, um, good question. So something I mentioned in the podcast, which maybe you're kind of alluding to, is that choosing different topics for a book can lead to very different outcomes. This actually comes back a little bit to the strategy point I was making a minute ago. The example I give is there is a chapter later in the book where I talk about deliberate practice. It could have been a book about deliberate practice where I talk about habits. But instead, it was a book about habits where I talk about deliberate practice. And I think the difference in how those two books would sell is enormous. Um, because if you're not familiar with the deliberate practice, it takes 30 seconds to kind of unpack it and talk about the concept and get everybody on the same page. And you don't have 30 seconds when someone's walking through the airport just trying to figure out what book to buy or looking browsing Amazon. You're not there to explain the context. So you need to be able to tap into a desire that they already have. I don't need to convince anybody that habits are important. I just need to convince you that this is the best book on the topic. So um, the answer to your question is trial and error, basically. Um, I wrote about a bunch of things early in my career. The first couple years, I wrote about how to have better squat form in the gym, and I wrote about the medical system in America. I wrote about creativity and productivity and habits and all the stuff I write about now, and a bunch of other things. And eventually, I found out when I write about habits and strategy, people seem to like that more and comment on it and email me about it. And when I write about the other stuff, they're kind of like, that's great, but you should keep it to yourself. Um, <laughs> and so, it's more just like finding the Venn diagram overlap between what I am naturally interested in and what the, uh, the audience is interested in. And uh, you know, I, I guess I'm kind of lucky in that way because I have a lot of interests and kind of get excited about all kinds of things. So I'll just write about a lot of stuff and then eventually there are some things that other people are excited about too. Um, but I don't think it makes sense to choose a topic just because it looks good on paper. You need to genuinely be fascinated with it. If we're talking about writing, probably if we're talking about anything really, like if you don't actually care, it's really hard to win in the long run because in every industry, there's seven billion people, eight billion people in the world. That's a lot of people. And so in every industry, you are gonna find somebody who is genuinely excited about that thing. And if you are competing with them, it is very hard to win if you are not genuinely excited too. And so you can flip the script and you can be the one who is hard to compete with if you find areas where you're naturally fascinated and excited about it. And so I think that's, that needs to be part of the conversation, but the other half is, are people naturally interested in it? Other questions? There's one over there. That's all, yeah, and somebody here too. Maybe you can get her, yeah. We've got time for maybe three or four more. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, if anybody asked me if you were, to, if I were to recommend a book, I would probably say Atomic Habits, like no other book in my mind except for that one. I agree. Um, You're, that's <laughs> great. We'll get you on the sales team. All right. Let's, let's talk about that. But uh, I'm curious, what's your like top three or four or five book recommendations that you think are very effective, similar to maybe your book? Yeah, um, you know, a tough question, obviously, because there's so many different books. I think the, the overarching answer, the lens that you need to have is read things that are useful for what you want to achieve. I've never read a book that's directly related to some project I'm trying to work on that I haven't been really excited about, even if it's pretty niche. Like, I bought this cabin in the woods and we're trying to reshape the pond that's there and I don't want to have a bunch of algae in the pond, so I want the water to be clear. So right now I'm reading a book on how to have a natural clear pond without algae and it's really good. Like it's, it's genuinely, I was like, this guy wrote a good book. Um, nobody else is gonna buy that book, right? But like it's, it's genuinely useful for what I'm trying to achieve at this point. Um, that said, there are a couple that I really love. So um, Lessons of History, uh, this is a book by Will and Ariel Durant. You can read it in like an hour. Uh, it's like 100 pages. This is a husband-wife combo who they were historians and for their whole career as professors, they wrote this enormous compendium of like everything that happened in history. It was like 12 volumes, thousands of pages, this huge thing. And then once they got done, they wrote this really little tiny book about the lessons of history that repeat themselves, the themes that recur again and again about how humans behave and what kind of is part of, seems to be part of human nature. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, a Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. I'm, so I don't know how interested a lot of you are in like physics and the oranges of the universe and things like that, but 
it was an inspiring book for me at the time that I read it because I was getting ready to write Atomic Habits. And I thought, you know, if this guy can write about complicated topics like this, and it can be easy enough for someone like me to understand, I have no excuse for not writing a book about habits that's easy to understand and easy to apply. Um, so brief history time. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, which is great. I actually like another book by the Stoics even more. It's called Manual for Living by Epictetus. Um, again, that's a book you can read in like an hour. There is nothing in that book that you haven't already heard at some point in your life, but everything in that book is worth hearing again. Um, so yeah, those are a couple different ones. There, I mean, obviously the answer is like kind of endless. I've, one I'm reading right now on this trip is called The Unforeseen Wilderness by Wendell Berry. It was written in the 60s. And um, it's not my like absolute favorite topic in the world to read about, but he might be one of my favorite nonfiction writers. It's unbelievable how many times I'll read it. And like, he writes a sentence. I'm like, I would never have thought to write that sentence. And yet it's the perfect way to phrase it. Um, so anyway, it's just great writing. Um, yeah. Let's go here, and then let's do this, uh, this one over here. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, so James, first off, thanks for um, coming out here, and we appreciate everyone that's organized this. So my question, uh, my name's Sutton Underwood, but um, my question is really for you personally. Um, obviously, you've changed tremendously over your life, um, and obviously written a book about what you've learned. Um, from the day when I think you got hit in the face, I'm sorry to even recommend or like bring that up, but how have you personally, as detailed as you can, truly overcome adversity? I think a lot of people here, it's easy when you're like succeeding to kind of improve on those habits, but when you're actually going through, like things are very hard, whether it's in your control or out of your control, how have you personally overcome those things? Yeah, uh, good question. I don't know. I, like, I don't even really identify or think of myself as someone who has overcome like incredible adversity. Um, we all have challenges in life. You know, I've had a couple. I write about some of them in the book. Probably one of the hardest things I did was build this business over the last 10 years, uh, especially the first like three years. Um, but I was also in my 20s and didn't have kids at the time. Like I, I look at some people who are entrepreneurs that are like 42 and have three kids. I'm like, the, you have a way harder situation than I did. So I think, um, you know, it was, it was very hard for me. It was as easy as possible and it was still very hard. I think that's like the way that I would phrase a lot of the, uh, the stuff I had to go through. My parents had it harder than I did. You know, when they were my age, they had, um, well, years ago, even when they were younger than I was, I mean, they had three kids, a mortgage, a daughter with cancer. My sister had leukemia at the age of three. Um, and like, I look at the stuff that they had to go through. I'm like, I, when I was 30, I was doing nothing, you know? Like they were, so um, I think, the, my general frame for mindset and mental toughness and persistence and adversity is there will be times when life challenges you and at those times you're just trying to keep your head above water and get through and like stay afloat. And I don't think you need to like berate yourself or feel guilty about it or I don't know, you know, um, listen to some motivational speaker tell you what you should do with your life. Like you're just trying to make it through. But there are other times when the waters are calmer and life is not as hard and in those moments, when life is not challenging you, you should challenge yourself and try to stretch yourself and push a little bit more. And I've been fortunate to have fairly calm water for large stretches of life. Uh, and whenever I get that, I try to push and stretch myself and you know, see what I can achieve. And that, for me, that's fun. You know, like I, I want to try to build something or create something or see how high I can go. Um, Mental toughness often gets framed as stubbornness, persistence, discipline, effort in like the face of great challenge. I think there's a second version of it that I often find more useful, which is flexibility, adaptability, um, things like I can be happy no matter who I'm with, or I can work with the resources that I have at hand, or um, I can live a good day no matter what I'm working on today. And mindsets like that are actually quite resilient and quite mentally tough because your mood is not dependent on your conditions. If your mood and your mindset is dependent on what is around you and what you have available to you, you're actually fairly brittle. Um, you might think you're being tough because you're like, no, it has to be this way, but actually it's pretty easy to break. Um, and so there are a few things in life that are probably worth being um, non-negotiable on but most things in life don't fall into that bucket. And um, so as best as possible, I try to be flexible and adaptable. And then um, 
survive the times when it's really hard and push in the times when it's much easier. Um, all right, let's take one, one more question, then we'll be done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So everything that you're, number one, I listen on 2.0, so thank you. I've heard your book a couple times on 2.0, so thanks. Um, but uh, yeah, so what we're talking about here is extremely individual, individualistic, right? Creating your own habits. Sure. So how can you take these and translate them to um, a leadership position or for a group of people when, as you say, it's attractive and easy and satisfying, are also variable amongst other people in like your organization mm. or your group? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. And probably speaks to part of the difficulty of applying this across like an entire company. You know, usually when we talk about habits in a business context, we talk about culture uh, is often what people uh, discuss. But really the true culture of any company is the shared habits of that group. You know, if it's not a habit, then it was just like a slogan you discussed at the offsite one time or a phrase that's on the wall in the office. It's not like actually part of your culture. So um, ultimately, I think at the root cause of all this, it's an HR problem. It's getting the right people on the boat. You know, if, you have, if everybody's there for the same reasons, if they've got a similar kind of mindset, if they are at least invested on the core pieces of the business mission, it's a lot easier for the habits to kind of fall in line. If somebody's there for the wrong reasons or doesn't really care about the core thing that we're all trying to rally around, it's sort of an uphill battle to get them on the same page. It feels like people are rowing the boat in opposite directions a lot of the time. And I don't know a perfect way to fix that because I don't think you can like make people be a certain way other than to say, look, some people need to be on the boat and some people don't, and that's, that's ultimately like an HR choice. Now, having said that, within the boat and having the right people on it, you still have a variance of behaviors and interests and attitudes, and um, sometimes it's about getting people in the right roles, making sure people are in like roles or positions or being asked to do things that fulfill them or that excite them. I talked about you know, one of the key pieces of building better habits is making it attractive. There, you would not want me to do a lot of, of things that seem unattractive to me. You know, just like, I, this is not a task that is like aligned with my strengths. But something that is like, that I'm good at or that really lights me up, man, I'll work on that all day long. And so some of that is matching up the right things. Um, and then a lot of it, maybe the most powerful thing, or I should, guess I shouldn't say the most powerful, but perhaps the most um, accessible thing that be, leaders can do is try to optimize the environment and the context to put their people in a good position. So the things that we talked about related to environment design, what's on the counter, what's in the living room, what's in the office, all, everybody who comes to the office is in an environment, so how is this designed so that we can position people well? Um, I always think about like, uh, this is not a perfect uh, example, but I think you'll get the, the main um, takeaway. If you have a dog and they don't do well around other dogs, and you're walking them down the street and you see somebody walking their dog toward you, don't like put them in a bad position, you know, like take them to the other side of the street. And that is so obvious to anybody when they're dealing with their pet, but man, we don't treat people like that. You know, it's like put people in a position to succeed. And I've, I have young kids, so we think about this a lot now, like how do we just set them up so they're in a good position and then we let them do their thing and learn and run around and do all the other stuff. But as long as the environment, like the guardrails are put up, then great, like you can let them run. And so I think that question is one leaders could probably sit with more. What does it look like to have everybody in this, um, on this team positioned well? What would it look like to put them in a context where they could thrive? It's just the same thing as like planting, putting a plant in rich, fertile soil versus putting it on a rocky cliff. You know, a lot of the time you're asking people to do a good job, but they're like clinging to the side of the cliff. Um, put them in rich, fertile soil and you can watch them blossom. So. Um, not a perfect answer, uh, and there are multiple factors there, but something to think about. Um, I want to thank you all very much for the opportunity today, and I'll uh, leave you with one parting thought, which is how can you get 1% better today? So thank you. Thank you.